Okay, well, that's 930, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I hope everybody's watching someplace. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, and I hope this is recording properly. Okay, normally I pass around a sign-in sheet, but that's pretty much worthless in uh, this environment. So, well, this is the uh, syllabus, uh, well, a little bit of a course outline and uh, policies and stuff like that, which I sent to you. So if you've looked over it, then you already know what's in here. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you. I guess what's important to you guys will be um, two tests and a final. That's your evaluation, okay? The test will be on iLearn, and they will be true, false, multiple choice, and there'll be small problems that you can pick A, B, C, D, E, do a calculation. And on the calculation problems, I, this is this, this a lot like the fundamentals of engineering exam that hopefully you'll get to uh, in a year, year and a half, something like that, where they give you a problem, they work it wrong three different ways. They think, okay, what kind of mistakes could these guys make? They'll make that mistake, work the problem, put the answer. So just because you match an answer, you know, first you go, ah, there, that's the answer. Yeah, uh, you know, it's not, that doesn't mean you got it right. Okay, so I pretty much do the same thing on this. Uh, if any of that changes, I'll let you know. Um, the schedule may change a little bit. We'll see how quickly we go through the topics. I haven't taught thermo in four or five years. So we'll see how long-winded I tend to, I tend to get long-winded sometimes and you have to rein yourself in and of course like thermo because you got to get a certain number of topics covered. Um, I don't know, any questions or anything? I think the rest of it's pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Uh, office hours I've listed as uh, 10 to 12, Monday through Friday. You're welcome to come by anytime I'm in there. I don't care, you know. If I don't put something down, they yell at me, so I put something down. And so, so, so I consider that to give me more flexibility to maybe not be there some, because you have the flexibility to come in anytime that you want to. Basically, if, I, if I'm real busy, I might ask you to come back, but generally speaking, uh, um, if, I, if I'm in there, I'm, I'm fair game. Okay, uh, this is uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, but we will, we will persevere. So the goal today is to uh, get through this uh, first chapter PowerPoint, and they they publish this as part of the book, and, and they're pretty good, and it gives me a format to talk from. Uh, I emailed this out to you. So if you have electronic stuff, you know, check your email. You have this. You can pull it up now, follow along, or you can take notes or however uh, you wish to do it. Uh, as time allows, I thought I would uh, uh, pull up some of the solutions to some of the problems. And by the way, you're not, you're not going to get 15 homework problems every week. So calm down. But so, some of these things are like unit conversions. I mean, come on, y'all. I'm sure I already know how to do that. But anyway, this will refresh you. So these problems are chapter one, chapter two, and not the same ilk, as we like to say, as the chapter three, four, five, and beyond problems, which may take two or three pages to get through. These, you could probably work all of them on two pages, I suspect. So, but I, and I will, um, I will email out solutions. I think I'm gonna do it on Wednesday. So I'll, I'll try to send the assignments on Saturday or Sunday. Hopefully you'll look at them some anyway on your own because, you know, when you get on the test, you know, I mean, it's nice to have a solution. You just you say, oh, well, I'll, I'll just read the solution. Well, that's fine if you're able to, you know, come up with the calculation algorithms and everything on your own. That's great. Saves time. But if you haven't worked on some of these, you know, before you see the solution to kind of get your, make sure that you can do this on your own without, you know, looking on a piece of paper, then the test may be more challenging. So I encourage you to work on them, you know, a couple days, you know, pick and choose the one and say, oh, I know how to do that. So go on to the next one, whatever. And then I'll send you solutions and you can look over the solution sheet. That's, I mean, this book is nice. Um, 
they they provide solutions on all the problems and all that stuff. Um, so, and let me see, I thought I would hold up the book. Uh, let's see, can I get myself up here? And I don't know. There we go. Uh, I guess if I stop screen share, that'll do it. There we go. Okay, so I don't know if y'all can read that or what. <laughs> looks like it's backwards, but whatever. Uh, this is uh, what Moran and Shapiro and some other authors, but they're the ones that started this long time ago. Ninth edition. Um, people always ask, do you need the ninth edition? Yeah, I don't know. That's up to you. Uh, what usually changes the most are the problems, and I will scan the problems like I did on chapter one, and I'll send those out. So if you have an older version of this, I mean, they really haven't changed thermodynamics very much, you know, for a long time, at least the stuff that we talk about at this level. So, you know, I'll leave that up to you, uh, which version of the book that you want. But anyway, the official one is ninth edition right there. Okay. okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, so with that, I believe that I will go ahead and launch into chapter one. And I hate to tell you this, but the first couple of chapters of Thermo are boring as the Dickens. It's definitions, it's sign conventions, it's just a bunch of stuff that you gotta know to get it before you can really be successful and read the, the later chapters, but it's really no fun going over this stuff. I'll do my best, but uh, you know, you can only do so much with chapters one and two of Thermo. And let's see, how does this thing go? There we go. So the way, the way they do these uh, PowerPoints is they give you learning objectives up front. So this is what you're supposed to get out of chapter one, basically fundamental concepts, um, closed system, control volume, boundary, surroundings, property, state, process. So you should know a thermodynamic definition of those. And, and that's all fair game on this first test. This first test, it'll be units. Can, can you convert from, you know, kilojoules to BTUs or something, you know? And, you know, so, I mean, it's not terribly difficult, but it's stuff that you gotta know. Um, extensive intensive properties, equilibrium. Um, of course, you know, the, 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 world, the world can take a simple problem and make it complicated by, if nothing else, different units. I mean, I've traveled, I've been fortunate through other activities outside the university. I've been all over the world. I've been to South Africa, I've been to Russia, I was in Ukraine uh, in December with uh, some, a, a DOE team. I've been to Brazil 16 times. So, and every time you go on a stupid plant, they've got a different system of units. I mean, they come up with, you know, I was in China, they came up with units in China I'd never seen before. And I'm sitting there going, it was like uh, on heat content of fuel, it was tons of coal equivalent, TCE. I was over there and went, what in the world is a TCE? Well, you get on Google and you go, ah, oh, just like you would, ah, oh, ton of coal equivalent. And it's got some conversion factor and then you can get into units you're comfortable with. But this dealing with units, I, I mean, I can't, I can't stress it enough you know, do, do y'all, have y'all heard of the Hubble telescope? You know, when they first put up the Hubble, it was blind. Do you know that? It was like $350 million for a telescope they couldn't see. You know why I couldn't see? A unit conversion error when they cut the mirrors. So, I don't know, six months or a year after they put it up, they sent up another, the space shuttle went up and they changed out the mirrors to one that was properly cut. And then all of a sudden, oh, Hubble could see, you know. Um, 
the uh, the Challenger crew that blew up. That was that that was that was a Morton Fire call problem. I'm not sure if that was unit conversion or not. But there's all kinds. If you get on YouTube or Google and search for disasters based on unit conversions, I'm sure you'll find a number of things that have fallen in because some engineer didn't know how to convert from this unit to that unit, got it wrong, the thing fell down. People got killed. So anyway, this unit thing, it seems simple, but man, you gotta be careful with units. Because not only that, it makes you look like an idiot. You go out there and go to work, turn something in for your boss, and the number is supposed to be between 15 and 20,000, and you turn in a, a, a number 1.5 million because you screwed up the unit conversion, you know, that, that's not gonna help your Christmas bonus. I'll tell you what, that doesn't, that doesn't get you a lot of confidence when you start doing other things for the next six months until you get a bunch of stuff right, then they go, okay, he made one mistake, but first crack in the box, you, you, you don't wanna do that. All right, more learning outcomes. Uh, we'll go through the temperature scales. Yeah, I'm in through that. Unit conversion factors and calculations. And they give you a methodology, which, you know, if you had to write out this methodology for all 15 problems, you'd probably get pretty tired of it. But if you're out on a job site and you know you got a big problem, a big a project, something that you're working on, having a structure like this is not a bad idea. So, you know, if I was doing all 15 of those, no, I probably wouldn't, especially if I wouldn't go turn it in. And even if I was gonna turn it in, unless the instructor just absolutely demanded it, I probably would do one or two and kind of slack off, you know, because it's, it's a very formalized process. But to know, to have something like that um, can, can really be a value for you. And, they, and that's why they put it in here. Okay, all right, so on to it, defining a system. Well, the system is whatever we're gonna study. You know, we could study this classroom. Okay, we could study energy, work, app, uh, uh, interactions of this classroom. You got a wall, exterior wall out there. I see a little bit of sun shining in. Okay, so, and then, so you, you have, but you have to define very formally what is the system. Does that wall, is that included in my system or is it just the air in the room? What about that projector? It's got electricity going into it. It's putting heat into the space. Is the projector itself in the room? Where, where do I draw the boundary? Because everything that goes across the boundary, you have to account for. So, as well as sometimes, you know, you, if everything is steady state in here, you may not have to account for interactions inside, inside the system. But if this is a transient, like if we're combusting something in here, or it's a piston cylinder, and you're about to fire the spark plug, uh, yeah, you're going to release a bunch of heat, and that's that's internal to the cylinder, and that has to certainly be taken into consideration. So, anyway, but the system is what we want to look at. Surroundings, everything else. So that's pretty simple. Boundary distinguishes the system from the surroundings. And, you know, a lot of times what we do in here is we'll take the air in a room and let that be the system. So we have this imaginary boundary between the air and the block and the floor and the ceiling and all of that, okay? So that gets done quite a bit. Okay, closed system, uh, a system that always contains the same matter. That's not the same amount of matter, that is the actual same molecules. Closed system, there is no mass transfer across the boundary, okay? And so there's your piston cylinder example. And so you just put this little dotted line, you know, and, and, and so it's right up against the boundary. So, and you, if you're writing this out formally, you say, well, the system is just the gas within the control volume. It's not the valve, it's not any part of the spark plug, but it's all of the air molecules that surround all of those things. Conceptually, that's what it means. Uh, no transfer of mass across the boundary can occur, I said that. 
isolated system. Okay, so that's a special type of closed system has no interaction with the surroundings. There's no heat transfer. There's no work interaction. I mean, all you got is what's in that mass to, uh, to deal with. No interaction with surroundings. Okay, now a control volume is a region in space. And, you know, good mechanical engineers, uh, but an engine is a great example. Okay, and so that's the, uh, uh, the uh, over there, fig figure A is kind of like, not a great picture of an engine, but, you know, it's kind of a picture, 3D picture of an engine, I guess. Um, and so they put the dotted line around, uh, of the box around it, and that indicates that's the control volume that we're working with. So anything that crosses any of those surfaces, we have to account for, okay? And so obviously, you know, if you're gonna burn, if you're gonna, gonna run your turbocharged Hemi down the street to avoid the gendarmes or whatever, uh, you're gonna have to have air coming in to support your combustion. So that air's, air's coming in. So now in this control volume, we have mass flowing across the boundary. Okay, and if we were going to do an analysis on that engine, we would probably want to know what's the temperature, what's the relative humidity, and what's the mass flow, and all of that, how much is coming in, and exactly what's the condition of that air that's going to go into that engine. Okay, um, let me see, did they show, ah, yeah, fuel. There's the fuel line uh, over there on the right. So we got to have some fuel coming in. And we got to have some exhaust gas going out, products of combustion. And we also have a drive shaft. Okay. Now, if you think about if you were an engineer going to do, you know, mock up some experiments on this, what of those components would be the hardest to measure? What do you think? Nah, I don't think so. But I'm, you know, I'm a thermal fluids guy, so I think that stuff's easy. What I would question is how much torque, how much energy is coming out that drive shaft? And how are you going to figure out how much energy is coming out? Are you going to put some sort of a strain sensor, a torque sensor? Or are you going to, you, what, what they probably do is run that into a dynamometer. But what if you wanted to take this measurement on your car? Well, are you going to drop your drive shaft and go get a dynamometer and all that sort of thing? Yeah, probably not. That sounds like a big job and, you know, you might do something bad to your car, you know? So measuring the energy comes out. I mean, we can measure air flows and we can measure temperature and relative humidity on air going in. We can measure, you know, put a liquid flow meter or something in that fuel line, something that spins. You know, it's got a little magnetic pickup and every time it goes around, it's calibrated. So, you, you know, and you can measure the temperature of the fuel if you want that and all that. You can send the fuel to the lab and find out the composition. You can do that. And the exhaust gases, that's just a gas flow. And then you can take a sample of it or you can stick a combustion analyzer in there and it'll tell you, you know, what's in the products of combustion, CO, CO2, NOx, you know, uh, NOx, oxides, probably no sulfur emissions, whatever. Unburned fuel could, could be in there. You can get all that stuff pretty easy. But for me, not being really a, a, gear, a gearhead kind of guy, I, I would be concerned about measuring that uh, shaft power coming out. At any rate. But, the, the, you know, the purpose of this is just to define a control volume. So, you know, what we usually do then, uh, you may have a picture of an engine like that, but you don't have to do great artwork. You know, we're in engineering because our English skills may be suspect and our art skills may be suspect, but hey, our math skills and our reasoning skills, pretty good, you know? Now, maybe you're a multi-talented, but uh, anyway, that's, in, in my experience, that's why people gradu you know, gravitate to engineering is because you don't like diagramming sentences. You know, you don't like worrying about what adjective and adverb is and all that stuff, or I never did. Anyway. So 
uh, you make a sketch like that and you try it and you put your dashed control volume line around it and then you indicate all of the flows, usually uh, work, fluid, or heat that's gonna cross. And see, they don't indicate any heat, but that engine's gonna get hot, right? And it's gonna lose heat across that boundary to the, to the surroundings, to the environment. And so that's something you would have to take into consideration on this. Okay, so mass may cross the boundary of the control volume, okay? And I stuck this in there, that's my, that's my slide. <laughs> Occasionally, I will customize a little bit. But, you, you know, in a similar situation here, what if, what if your boss, say, say you work for Bell and & Gossett and you're making pumps and, and motors and stuff, and the boss says, hey, I want you to take that pump over there and I want you to test the efficiency of that motor, okay? So, well, what are you concerned with? Well, you got electricity coming in, that's energy. We'll find out that's a form of work, but that's energy that's coming into the motor. The motor's gonna get hot, right? It's gonna give off heat. You're gonna have to estimate that because some of the energy that came in got transferred into heat by friction and electrical stuff that goes on in there that I have no idea about. And, you know, it gets hot. Put, you ever put your hand on an operating motor? You gotta be careful. Um, how, by, just by the way, if this is not a very good motor, but if that's an operating motor and I come in here, put my hand on that thing and I can hold it about one or two seconds, just, oh, how hot is that? What would you swag at temperature? Go out there, put your hand on something. That's pretty good. What if it's 180? Oh, yeah, there, there ain't gonna be any 1001. You're out of there. And of course, if it's 500, <laughs> you're a crispy critter. <laughs> you know, you've got, you've got at least first degree burns if you just touch it, you know. But the, the rule of thumb I use, and, and you know, and part of it is how much do I like pain? Oh God, I love it, oh, that hurts, you know. Some people go, oh, I can't take that. But someplace between 140, 140, 130, 130 and 150 is pretty good range. I usually just say 140. If I can put my hand on there and count like one, two, something like that, and then I have to come off, it's someplace in the neighborhood of 140. It could be 130, it could be 150, you know, and all that sort of thing. But, you know, as, as a practicing engineer, you need to be able to go out there and, you know, I mean, if it's something you know could be a thousand degrees, you're not gonna do that. But if it's a, like a motor, it's not gonna be. And it's gonna burn up if it operates much over 170, 180 for very long. So, uh, but anyway, so we got electricity coming in, we got heat going out, and then again, we've got torque going all out to a pump, and a pump is moving fluid. Now somehow we have to evaluate what's coming out in the shaft of that motor. Well, again, you could, you could take that loose, put it on a dynamometer, or you could get a pump characteristic. So the pump manufacturers will tell you at a, at a given pump head and flow, this is the efficiency of a typical pump. Now it doesn't have to be that pump because how do they know? They pull 10 of them off the line and test them and average the results and put out the pump there. But you can get some kind of an idea if you know that what's the energy that the pump is putting into the water, and then the pump curve tells you efficiency, maybe it's 50% efficient, so then you double it. Oh, and that's the shaft power. You measure the electrical power, and bingo. So you know energy out of the motor, you know energy into the motor, guess what? You got efficiency. So anyway, this is just, one, I mean, there's, there's millions and millions of thermal applications, but anyway, I put that in there. Okay, uh, microscopic and uh, macroscopic views of systems. Well, okay, so when I was a young PhD student, 
uh, maybe five, 10 years ago, <laughs> maybe a few more years ago than that. But anyway, we don't want to go there. Um, I took a course on statistical mechanics. It was actually in chemical engineering, 7,000 level PhD course, oh boy. And what did we do? We did, we calculated properties from the molecular level. So we would take, just take a gas, oxygen or whatever, and you drill down to like the Boltzmann equation and all of this stuff, because you're working at the molecular level. That's a pain in the rear. It's not really a lot of fun. And you do everything with probability and statistics. There's these things called probability density functions. Oh Lord, I'd have to go back and look up all that stuff. I just remember I was never so glad to be finished, of course. And when I turned in the second test, it was everything was taken. And we worked and we worked and we worked. I mean, I was I worked, I don't know, probably 25, 30 hours on this test. These problems were just horrific. Turned them in, I got like an 85 or something. You know, ah, oh, crap, I thought I did better than that. Well, we went back to class the next time after we got it back, and the instructor came in and says, uh, Mr. Cunningham, I owe you an apology. That problem I took off, you know, like, I don't know, 15, 12 points on, you worked it right, I worked it wrong. <laughs> I went, oh yeah, yeah, I like this now. That was the only thing I remember liking about that course. But anyway, so this microscopic system, you actually get down to, to the characteristics of molecules and atoms and even subatomic particles that make up the matter in the system and try to calculate properties and things based on that. I mean, it's actually kind of cool, but it's just like way, it looks just doesn't look anything like classical thermodynamics that we're going to study in here. But that's microscopic. Okay, so, and what's he say here? Uh, aims to characterize by statistical means, average behavior particles making up systems, describe overall behavior. So, um, statistical thermo or uh, statistical mechanics or whatever, there's different names for it. Macroscopic means that uh, we're gonna look at behavior in terms of gross effects. Like I got a piston cylinder, I, got, I put a pressure gauge and a thermocouple in there, and man, what's the temperature, what's the pressure? I ain't worried about the, 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 the spin of the molecule or the resonance of this or the, the, the what are they got? The, 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 which, which orbitals the electrons are in, and oh my gosh, it just goes on and on and on at the uh, microsc microscopic level. But this, I, hey, I got a temperature, I got a pressure, I got a volume, hey, this is good engineering stuff, you know? So that's what we're gonna be working on in here. Uh, engineering, thermodynamic uses predominantly, now some of the arguments in the book will be made at the molecular level but you're not, you know, that's just to determine macroscopic properties that you're gonna use for a whole system. So we're not gonna be calculating things based on, you know, the molecular level. Okay, property, oh Lordy. So macroscopic uh, characteristic of a system to which a numerical value can be assigned. Um, so, you know, this is temperature, pressure, volume, stuff like that. Uh, system shown, examples include the mass. And, you know, again, that's a, that's a piston cylinder. That's our classic example in the first, you know, three or four chapters of this. Um, and the gas itself would be the uh, system and it would be a closed system. The volume. What's the total volume of the gas? Energy, which energy is in it? Pressure and temperature. So those are typical. That's not all of the properties by any stretch of the imagination, but that's typical. And so if you have defined values of this, it really relates to an equilibrium state, which we'll talk about in a second. You know, like when when a spark plug you know, fires and we detonate that fuel in that cylinder, during that quick instant that stuff is burning like that, there really is no 
no way to write an equation between the properties. It's such a chaotic event that you can't take a nice little equation like the ideal gas law or something like that, PV is equal to MRT or something like that, and say that holds during that process. PV equals MRT holds, but you know, if you have like an equilibrium situation before you fire it and after you fire it, when it kind of calms down, then you might say that that relationship holds, but in between, no, 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 no. And that's why people that do research on engines, they try to get real fast data acquisition systems and they put sensors all over the place and they just try to measure because inside that, inside that piston, when that thing goes off, you've got a pressure distribution, you've got a temperature distribution, it's burning in the center, it's not burning over here in the corner, this, that, and the other. And I mean, it's just a chaotic mess, you know? So you gotta be careful thinking about what can I calculate and what can I not calculate because it's not anywhere close to an equilibrium condition where I have equations of state that I can use to relate properties. State, condition of a system as described by its properties. Uh, example, state of system is described P, V, T, and lots of other properties. Um, what we find is that we don't have to, to define a state, we don't have to know all of the properties. You know, for like, a, for like steam or something, boiling water, we really just need two. We need two independent properties for most, they call them simple substances, which is just like a bunch of oxygen, a bunch of nitrogen, or, or even a mixture that doesn't interact a lot together. You know, we'll talk more about that. We typically need just two properties. And then by equations and relations, we can, we can figure out the rest of them, okay. Okay, process, uh, transformation from one state to another implies equilibrium at both ends. Uh, when any of the property of the system changes, state changes, the system said to undergo a process. Okay. Example, so piston moves back, we have more volume in the system. You know, question, did, did something exterior pull the piston back? Or did we develop, you know, burn some fuel or something and the gas pushed the piston back? So if you're doing an analysis, that makes a difference, right? Whether the gas is expending energy to push that thing back doing work, or whether the surroundings is dragging that thing back, the interaction with the gas is different. Anyway. Okay, now we've got extensive and intensive properties. Okay, so the way I like to think about this, just look at either side, look at state two. That's kind of a big, big, you know, we got a lot of volume in there. Okay, and so we can think about a pressure, a volume, and a temperature, and mass, and other things. If we cut that thing in half, and had just, just, just cut that thing in half, would that change the amount of mass that we had in the system, if we only considered half of it? Well, yeah, if it's equally distributed, we'd only have half the mass. Ah, it's extensive. If we cut it in half, would that change the volume of the system? Aha, that's extensive. If we cut it in half, would that change the temperature of the system? No, that's intensive. So see, that's, how, that's, that's the way I was always taught to tell. Cut the system in half and see if the, the property that you're talking about like is half as much if you only have half the system. If it doesn't matter, like pressure. Let's say I got 100 PSI in the thing, I cut it in half, do I still have 100 PSI in the half I have left? Sure, it's intensive. Energy, talk about total energy content. If I cut it in half, I only have half the mass, do I have half the energy? Yeah, it's intensive. So, 
that's how I think about it. But, you know, read the book and, you know, these authors, sometimes they'll go all, all the way around the block twice before they just tell you, well, you just do this and, and, and then you got it. So, anyway. Okay, so extensive depends on the size or extent of the system. If you cut it in half, you change the extent. So then you're going to change all of the extensive properties. Mass, volume, energy. They, they like this barbell set, you know, so you can take it apart or you can put it together, but if it's comprised of the same pieces, it's going to have the same mass, it's going to have the same volume. And if you don't change the temperature of it or something, it's going to have the same energy. Okay. So uh, its value for an overall system is the sum of the values of the parts into which it is divided. So extensive. And you know, you can just, you can just see the, the, the quiz questions, right? You know, as you study this stuff, a good, a good thing to think about is every once in a while I think, you know, if I, was, if I had to write a test on this, and you know, extensive property will be on there, intensive property, system property, all that stuff. What would I ask? What would you ask? To see if your other classmates, you know, I do that sometimes. I have students submit five questions out of you know, certain material, and then I put the test together out of all of the questions that you guys ask. You guys ask much harder questions than I do most of the time. I go, oh man, if I ask that, they're gonna crucify me. So I'll put whoever's name submitted that over there by, this question is submitted by Pete over here. You know, he's, he's, he's pretty tough. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Anyway, I do sometimes ask students to suggest questions. Uh, so the value can vary with time, but not position. Okay, intensive uh, is independent of the size or the extent of the system. Uh, pressure, temperature, its value is not additive as for extensive properties. Like, you know, you can't come to every you know, every cubic centimeter of a big system and add up the temperature, add them all up, you're going to get a huge number, and that means absolutely nothing. So, same thing on pressure. Uh, may vary from place to place within the system at any moment, so it's, it can be a function of both position and time, so that's a little different. Okay, so extensive intensive property. You need to uh, have a feel for those. And later on, we will derive some properties like specific volume, enthalpy, entropy, some other things that we use, we develop in chapter two or chapter three. And some will be, most of them are intensive. I don't remember any that are extensive off the top of my head, but we'll see when we get there. Equilibrium. Um, when a system is isolated, it does not interact with surroundings. However, its state can change as a consequence of spontaneous events. You know, you could have combustion, you could have a chemical reaction going on, um, stuff internally as its intensive properties such as temperature pressure tend toward uniform values. So, you know, if you've got a reaction, it will eventually proceed to completion, and then you got steady state equilibrium after that. So, when all such changes cease, the system is at an equilibrium state. So, when there's no changing of properties, temperature, pressure, anything, that's equilibrium. Equilibrium states and processes from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state play important roles, as we will see. Okay, let's play some with units. Uh, you know what a unit is. So we have two systems. Yeah, and there's lots of variations within the two systems for sure. But anyway, System International, SI, what we typically call metric which most professors love, but I don't. <laughs> so it's probably good, it's probably good for you that you have me for thermo. 
because I'm going to make you do this other system of units. And when you get out in the real world, the engineering practice I have done has probably been 90% in not metric, but English engineering units. And most professors don't like or don't teach much on engineering. And I'm telling you, you got to know both. When I'm in engineering uh, or English units, I'm like a pig in mud. I'm just, oh God, I feel so good. As you start throwing metric stuff at me, I go, okay, I can do this. I know I can do this, but I don't like it one bit. You know, you can be the other way so long as you can function successfully in both systems. Okay, so there's the uh, primary units mass is a kilogram or it's a pound mass. Now, some books on pound mass put LB and a little M after it. He puts LBF for force, so you just have to be careful. If you see LB by itself, that's mass. If you see LBF, that's force, okay? And, you know, we'll see they could be the same, but they don't have to be the same, right? Uh, length, meter, foot, time, second, second. And force, so force is a derived unit based on a definition, okay? And so you see that uh, one Newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. That's a definition. That is a conversion constant. It's a definition, okay? Well, that one's, that, one's, that one's not bad because it's just one. And sometimes you can kind of gloss over the units and you can get it right in metric because the conversion factor that you need is one. Well, hell, who cares, <laughs> you know, really? I mean, okay, I didn't cancel out all the units, but hey, I got the right number. But in English, that conversion constant is 32.174. Now that's the same number as standard gravity, but that's not gravity. A lot of books call that G sub C. And the C is to remind you that it's a conversion constant, even though it has the same number as standard gravity, C load. Okay? So a a force is, is defined as 32.174, um, a pound force, 32.174 pound mass foot per second squared. Definition. And in, in, in the, the English problems, you will use that conversion constant all of the time. It's not gravity. Have you heard that? Is that gravity? No, it's not gravity. But I guarantee you. And the other thing, I'm sorry, the folks uh, on the board probably can't see this. But anyway, take G over G sub C and look at the units. What I call G sub C. So this is what? Gravity, say it's 32.1, say it's standard gravity. So it's the same number, but this is what? Feet per second squared, right? Well, G sub C is 32.174. And I gotta look, I can't remember all that mess. Pound mass foot, pound mass foot, pound force second squared. Oh, uh, well, what happens? This is it's a foot. So the foot goes out, the foot goes out, seconds go out, seconds go out. And that ratio is pound force to pound mass. Okay? That's just the right when you, when, if you take gravity and divide it by this constant, you, the units come out, the, the pound, pound force divided by pound mass. So if gravity is the same as this, what's the difference between a pound force and a pound mass? Nothing. If you're on the moon, this turns into what, nine or something, whatever the number it turns into on the moon. Ma you know, this doesn't change, this changes, 
And so a pound mass doesn't change, but the pound force changes. That's the weight of it, okay? So anyway, I'm sorry if you guys couldn't see the board, but just uh, do that little exercise and uh, look and see how the units work. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see, in these unit systems, so mass, length, and time are base units and force, like I said, is a derived or calculated unit using them. And it comes out of F equals MA, Newton's second law. So in SI, one Newton, one kilogram accelerated one meter per second squared. Definition of a Newton. And in English, a pound force, one pound accelerated at standard gravity, 32.174 pound mass foot per second squared. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to density and specific volume. Uh, from macroscopic perspective, uh, dis description of matter simplified by considering it to be distributed continuous. Okay, so this is the continuum assumption. Okay, so basically you start thinking about, you, you, you know, you want some like density or you want mass or something, you know, at a point and you start shrinking the volume. Well, how far can you shrink that volume? If you shrink it down to a point, what, what, what's the diameter of a point? Zero. So if you have a point, how many molecules can be in the point? None, because the point is smaller than the molecules, right? The point shrinks down to nothing. So if you're gonna have a macroscopic property, you can only shrink that sucker down so much in the definition. You can't let it go to zero or you have nothing. Or I guess if that point was on a molecule, you would have some incredibly huge number. You say, I mean, it loses, it, it loses its concept if you take the volume too small, as we'll see here in just a second. Uh, when substances are treated as a continua, it's possible to speak of their intensive thermodynamic properties at a point. So a continuum means everything is smoothly spread out and molecules. If I have a system, I don't have all the molecules on one half of it and nothing on the other half. I have it basically smooth, you know, spread out all over the place. That's what we mean by the continuum assumption. Okay, and so here's the definition of uh, density. We always use rho, a lowercase rho for density. And it's the limit as the volume shrinks to this V prime, which is the smallest volume for which a definite value of that ratio actually exists. Because if I go too small, it gets crazy. Okay. And so it's in that limiting process, it's the mass in that volume divided by the volume itself. So mass per unit volume is density. And in the definition, we can shrink it only so small before we violate the continuum assumption. That's what we're saying there. See, I'll tell you this first two or three chapters of Thermo, it's just so much of this definition. And if you ever, if you go on in your studies to graduate school, there are theoretical thermodynamics courses Oh my gosh, I've got a book now. If everybody wants to say, I've got a book, come by my office. I'll let you, I'll let you borrow a book. Gaftopoulos and Beretta. There, there's descriptions in there. You would have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, you have to just study the book, even though you've had two thermo and graduated and this, that, and the other. But a heat transfer is a specific non-work interaction. It's not a heat transfer. It's a spe specific non-work interaction. What in the heck is the point of that? I, I have no idea. But anyway, I took it and then years ago I taught it once or twice around here. And we would sit, we would have a small group. We would literally sit and we would we would put copies, you know, a paragraph of that text up on and read it over and over again and try to figure out what the heck it meant. <laughs> so the foundations of thermo really are almost philosophical in nature. 
it's, it's, it, I mean, I found it to be interesting, even though it was kind of a pain in the rear at the same time. So, anyway. Okay. Density, mass per unit volume, we said that. Density is an intensive property that can vary from point to point. So see, this is a, this is a derived, a calculated um, property. That's intensive. Yeah, a five-year-old. Oh, Rachel, can you put yourself on mute, hon? Thank you. Uh, SI units are <laughs> kilograms per yeah, meter. My kids uh, English units, uh, pounds mass per cubic foot. I want my kids to play sports. You gotta have a definite <laughs> gender to play sports. <laughs> you can't be a boy on the girls team. You gotta like, like your daughter play football. Oh, well, yeah, I definitely would. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. More than one way to scan a cat. Of course, she can unmute. <laughs> she may be mad at me already, right? <laughs> uh, what am I doing? Display. There we go. All right, so specific volume. Okay, you really need to remember this. You probably already know it. Specific volume and density are reciprocals. So if you know little v, one over it is rho. If you know rho, one over it is specific volume. And the units just flip. Uh, so specific volume, volume per unit mass, uh, intensive property can vary point to point. SI, meters cubed per kilogram. English, like I said, feet cubed per pound mass. Uh, and he makes a comment here, which is, which is true. Uh, if you're working with gases, sometimes the density value, you know, it's real obnoxious to work with numbers like 0. 0.00032. You know, all these daggum silly zeros hanging all over the place. So if you take one over that, you get like, hey, you get a real number, something you, is, is much more palatable to uh, work with. Uh, we do this in, uh, in the HVAC field um, in determining or relating the amount of moisture in air. So the, the one unit that comes on, I'll show you all a psych chart here one of these days shortly. But so if you have air that's, it's what, it might be probably 75 in here, maybe 50% relative humidity. So there is a certain amount of moisture per uh, cubic foot or per pound, I guess it's usually per pound of dry air. It might be like 0 0.002 pounds of moisture per pound of dry air. Well, that's kind of obnoxious too. So in the HVAC industry, they use grains. You ever heard of measuring moisture in grains? Yeah, anybody know the conversion? How many grains are there in a pound mass of water? 7,000. So what they do is they take that little number, that 0 0.003, and they multiply it by 7,000, and they get a nice number, you know, 29.3 or something, and they work with that to relate the amount of moisture in air. So this, this sort of thing gets done quite a bit, but 7,000 grains to a pound. One of these days, I, I have never researched that. That may go back to biblical times, you know, I'm not sure. I suspect that's a unit that's been out there a while. We, we talk, what am I doing? Oh, I got time. Um, in HVAC, we also talk about a ton of cooling. You ever heard that unit? So you buy, anybody ever work on or buy an air conditioning unit? Go to Lowe's, get a window air conditioner. A big one, one ton. Ooh, that's heavy. And that ain't what we're talking about. It's the cooling capacity. One ton is 12,000 BTUs an hour. And that comes from the days when the ice truck. Now, believe it or not, I'm not old enough to remember ice trucks. My grandparents 
they had an ice box, like a real ice box. Have y'all seen a, an, an ice box? You probably haven't even seen one. I mean, it's an insulated cabinet and it has two doors. In the bottom door, you would take a block of ice and put it in there and close it. And as that ice melted, that provided the cooling for the upper cabinet, which is where you put your milk and your cheese and your eggs and whatever you wanted to keep cool. Well, the ice truck ran every day, every 24 hours. So the ton, a ton of cooling is the amount of cooling you get per hour if you melt a ton of ice in 24 hours. And if you do that calculation, we'll do it in here one of these days, it comes out 12,000 BTUs an hour. And you go down to the TTU chiller plant down there, and they got big refrigeration machines that make the chill water to do air conditioning on campus, and they're rated in tons. And it goes all the way back to when the ice trucks used to run. It's where that unit comes from. Anyway, what's that got to do with specific volume? I have no idea. Uh, anyway, moving on. Pressure. Okay, consider a small area A passing through a point in a fluid at rest. Okay, well, we'll do that in a minute. Let's think about pressures. If we, if we close that door and put, let's say we put a tenth, one tenth of a PSI on the outside of the door above the atmospheric pressure, could you open that door? A tenth of a PSI. And a PSI is what? Pounds per square inch. You think you could open the door? What do you think? Sounds like you could. Let's get out the calculator. So what, what size is that door? What do you think? Four by seven? Something like that? Okay. Four times seven. I, I could probably do that in my head. That's 28. But that's square feet, right? And how many square inches is there in a square foot? It's 12 squared, right? 12 inches on the side. 144 times 144. That's 4,032 square inches on the face of that door. And each one is going to have a tenth of a pound on it times 0.1. That's 403.2 pounds. You think you could push that door open? Probably not. Maybe two or three of us could push that door open. And the reason I do that is when you're out there in the working world, pressure is very dangerous. It, if you have, now, if, if, you've got, if you've got one square foot, Okay, it's 144 times, it's 14 pounds. Okay, I mean, you know, hey, I can, I can handle 14 pounds, you know. I can handle 20, I can't handle 30 really, but anyway. Um, but if you, have, if you have doors, if you have chambers, if you have rooms that can develop pressure, you have to be extremely careful. People get killed by what seems like a small number. Oh, it's just one PSI. Yeah, but how many, how many square inches is it over? I think about that. I one time, well, yeah, I better not. I've got lots of war stories. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you my other pressure story here next time or the time after. Okay, so anyway, this is, say we got a small area, one inch square or something, passing through a point in a fluid at rest, so it's down in a fluid. So fluid on one side, because there it's, a, it's, a, it's a compressive force, it's pushing into that area. And uh, it's nor the, 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 it's the, you take the normal force times the area and that gives you the total force. But of course, then when you're down in the water, you got the same fluid on the other side, so it just kind of balances out, nothing happens. <clears throat> but you know, if you, if you like dive down to the bottom of the swimming pool, where you got all that force, you know, you don't have to go very deep before you, you know, you just dive down 10 feet and you, man, you feel it pushing in your ears and you got your eyes open and all that sort of thing. So pressure builds up pretty quick. Okay, and so here's a definition of pressure. It's the normal force divided by area as the area shrinks to, 
you know, a small, a small a chunk as we can and not violate the continuum assumption. So that's kind of our typical of how we define a lot of these properties. Pressure units, oh, my favorite. A Pascal is a Newton per meter square. Y'all remember Pascal? I'm sure you've encountered Pascals before. And then we take multiples of it. So K stands for a thousand. So that's a thousand Newton per meter square. Bar, you should memorize that. I forget that all the time and it causes me all kinds of consternation. A bar is a hundred thousand Newtons. It's not Spanky's. <laughs> it's a hundred thousand Newtons. And of course, mega uh, Pascal is a million. So that's 10 to the sixth. So it's good to remember that stuff. Uh, English, we do pounds force per square foot, pounds force per square inch. Most of the time when you're doing calculations, you want to get rid of inches. I mean, it depends on the calculation, but generally speaking, most other units, you wind up using feet. When you see inches in your units, you got to kind of, that's like a wake up call. I got, uh, I got inches. I'm probably going to have to get rid of these things. You know, if you got square inches, you got that 144 number hanging around to help you, or what is it, 1728 if it's cubed. Absolute pressure, okay. Uh, absolute pressure is pressure with respect to, to a complete vacuum. I mean, you take a cylinder and somehow or the other, you get every dadgum molecule out of it. So by the way, on a molecular level, what causes pressure? It's those molecules that have kinetic energy, velocity, banging in the side of the container. As Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions and billions of collisions. And the faster they're going, the more force. And they, by, you know, depends on the surface, but you know, a lot of times it's a fairly elastic collision, so they just hit, bounce off. They take most of their energy and they go hit another wall, another wall, another wall, another wall. It's those, it's those collisions. Okay, thing moving through space pretty quick, bam, hits the door. You get it hitting all over the door pretty soon, you got, that's imparting force to the door, and then, you know, you got to push to open it or it comes flying open in your face. So if your pressure is with respect to no molecular, no molecules, absolutely nothing, then that's an absolute pressure. Complete vacuum is what you're comparing to, okay? Ah, when you use ideal gas law, I'm sure we've all made this mistake. When you're plugging in these relations, you gotta put absolute pressure. Now, if I go down to the tech boiler house and look in the steam line coming out of the boiler, it says 100 PSI. Is that absolute? No, that gauge is measuring relative to the atmosphere around it. Okay, so it's 100 plus atmospheric pressure is absolute. So you've got to be careful because when we get into steam tables and stuff, the steam tables are absolute pressure. The gauge on the boiler is gauge pressure. And so if I take that 100, I got to, you know, I can either estimate barometric pressure or I can take a barometer with me and read it. Maybe it's 14.3. So I got to add 14.3 to that 100. I get 114.3. And I go crap because now I got to interpolate or I got to have some software, which is nice. You can actually put that number in. Okay. But mostly in, 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 in thermodynamic stuff, you're pretty much always okay using absolute. But if you use gauge, you got to be careful. Pressure measuring devices often indicate the difference between absolute pressure 
of the system and absolute pressure of the atmosphere. And that's what I mean by gauge pressure. Because atmospheric pressure, that gauge, if I pull it out of the boiler and set it on the counter and it's a good gauge, it's going to read zero. But guess what? It's still got atmospheric pressure pushing into it. Okay, so uh, I don't know how well, ho hopefully you can see this. Uh, so down at the bottom, that's absolute, it says zero pressure down there. That's absolute zero pressure. Okay, so the bar on the left, we've got some pressure up there at the top that is a pressure above atmospheric pressure. Like maybe that's boiler pressure. Maybe that's 100 pounds or something like that. So if, if I measure that boiler pressure with a gauge, then I have to add the, and I want absolute, then I have to add the atmospheric pressure to it. So the middle bar is atmospheric pressure. From there up to the top is gauge pressure. And from the very bottom up to the very top is absolute pressure that's above gauge, okay? Now, if I have a vacuum, I report that as how far underneath atmospheric pressure am I? So if I say I'm uh, five PSI vacuum, then the absolute would be 14.7 if that's, that's standard atmospheric pressure minus the five, and that's how tall that P absolute is on the right. So it's all pretty common sense, but you gotta make sure you're clear on it, okay? And these are just equations. Gauge is the total absolute minus the atmospheric absolute. And then if, you, if uh, you're less than atmospheric, you take atmospheric and subtract the absolute and you call that the, vac the, the, the amount of the vacuum. So if the amount of the vacuum goes to zero, then you're back at atmospheric pressure. Temperature. <laughs> oh, this stuff's great. Okay, we have two blocks. One is hot, one is cold. They're brought into contact and they're perfectly insulated so that their only interaction is with each other. And isolated, um, they would interact thermally and there would be observable changes, i.e. the hot block would get colder and the cold block would get warmer. Uh, when all changes in observable properties cease, we say they're in thermal equilibrium. This is how we define a thermal equilibrium, another definition. Temperature, a physical property that determines whether two objects are in thermal equilibrium. Bunch of words. Okay, the way I think about after that statistical mechanics class, I like to think about, and I, this is partially true, it's probably not completely true, but I think about molecular vibrations. Say translation, bam, hits a wall, that's pressure. But what if this thing isn't moving, but it's hot? How does that manifest itself in the molecule? Well, in my little brain, and the little bit I remember, there's all kinds of, uh, different uh, vibrational modes. You know, like think about a water molecule. It's got what, H2O, right? It's got a hydrogen and what, two oxygen? Is that eight? No, two hydrogen and an oxygen. Well, you know, they got little, you, you see the little balls in chemistry where they, they mock these things up? Well, if you put them on springs, you know, so, so you got the oxygen and two hydrogen, looks like a little antenna's coming up. But think about that thing, and those things, those things are just vibrating like crazy. Just, or the thing could be spinning like crazy. Well, see, that's energy. And you grab onto that thing, and all that energy gets transferred to your hand. It's like, whoa, that's hot. That's how, that's how you perceive it. You perceive it as temperature. And so really, the energy is stored in the molecule in different vibratory modes. And depends on how complex the molecule is. Some of these things got little hydrocarbon groups all over the place. Man, they can be giving it this and giving it this. And, you know, they can, they can be jumping all over the place, you know? And it's that energy and it, the way I think about this that relates to the temperature. And so they also say at absolute zero, 
all molecular motion stops, right? Not only does it not run into the wall, but it just, that's it, nothing. No, not even a little twitch, you know, it's done. And then when you heat it up, things start moving again. So anyway, I don't know if that helps, but maybe it does. Uh, okay, thermometer, any objects with at least one measurable property that changes uh, with temperature can be used as a thermometer. There's all kinds of stuff can be used. It's called a thermometric property. Substance and exhibits changes in a thermometric, it's called a thermometric substance. Just definitions. Liquid and glass thermometer. Got a little capillary tube in there. It's got some, used to be mercury, but uh, we don't do mercury anymore. No, 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 no. They just redid the ME office. Y'all notice if you've been by the ME office, they got new floors, they redid the whole thing. The uh, floor tiles were coming up and they had asbestos in them. Years ago, we redid the measurements lab down there. And of course, back in the day, all the manometers, all this stuff had mercury in it. Well, they would pop up, when they redid that floor, they popped up all these tiles and there's little, little, little puddles of mercury living down there under where they'd been spilled all over the place. You know, it's uh, been a, been a lab for like 20, 30 years and nobody knew it was dangerous. They pulled up those tiles and man, there was mercury everywhere. So all that's been cleaned out. But anyway, uh, I think they use alcohol solutions and different stuff, stuff that, you know, it just expands and contracts with temperature. Uh, put it in a capillary tube, calibrate it. Uh, the space above the liquid, uh, if, if the liquid is volatile, some of it will probably evaporate there be some molecules up there, or they can put an inert gas up there. So, anyway, just definitions. L is a thermo, you know, as it expands, then it moves up and down the length of the tube. Other things thermocouples. Thermocouples, um, dissimilar metals. If you take two different types, so it's got to be the right kind of wire. You, 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 you twist them together here, twist them together here you have the same wire on the leads, you put it on a very sensitive voltage voltmeter. And what they do, they talk about having a reference junction. So theoretically, one of them you would put in an ice bath and the other you put on whatever you want to measure. And that generates a voltage because of the dissimilar metals and that gets transduced into a temperature. So that's how thermocouple works. It generates a voltage. Uh, thermistors, I think that's a, a electric resistance change. And radiation thermometers measure intensity coming off the surface, transduce it into a temperature. Okay, temperature scales. Uh, okay. Well, Kelvin is the SI base unit for temperature. And if you can, I don't know, that's pretty small. I don't know if you can see all of that. Let's see, Kelvin, absolute zero is zero. Rankin is the absolute scale for uh, English units. And those zero points are the same. Uh, let's see, so to the steam point is what, 373.15 Kelvin and that's 671.67 Rankin. Um, a degree Kelvin, if you increase the temperature of something one degree, that's a bigger increase than one degree Fahrenheit. It's five, what is it? It's nine fifths or 1.8, okay? So if I was to, increase the temperature or something 100 degrees C, I would have to increase the temperature 180 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So, I don't know, I'm not, I think I'm gonna bore you with all that, all the conversions, I know y'all have been through that before, so. Uh, design, engineering design, decision-making process that draws principles. Uh, engineering and fields uh, establish. Uh, I don't know. Designs. Designs are usually the constraints are economics. 
I did uh, a little consulting firm for the last 25 years or so, and I did HVAC design for at least 15 years. And I can't tell you how many projects I've designed. And you put all these bells and whistles in, this energy efficiency, this stuff, and they bid it. And it comes back on bid and, oh, it's over budget. That's too much. So then you know what you get to do? Strip out all of your energy conserving features and redesign it and send it out again. So, you know, that's the, the, the economic side of this thing is huge. It's difficult to teach or to talk, I guess, managers, uh, building owners, business people into spending more money on the front end to make it more efficient for the life of the building. They say, I'm not gonna pay the utility bill. I'm gonna rent it, I'm gonna sell the building. What do I care how for you? Well, you'll get more money for it if it's more efficient. That guy I'm selling, those people, they don't know. They don't know a kilowatt hour from a can of tuna. <laughs> yeah, so it can be a tough sell. After several years of doing all these designs twice, I pretty much just, I would ask the, uh, the person I, that was gonna own the building, do you really want this to be efficient? Do you wanna spend an extra five or 10% on your mechanical design to make it more efficient? Most of the time they say, no, yeah, okay. I'm just gonna do this one once. If that's, if that's what they want, that's what they get. Uh, and this is this problem solving methodology. Known, read the problem, that's good. Think about it, identify what's known. Fine, write down. And, and this, when you see these problems I send you, they go through this on all of their problems. Uh, state what is to be determined. Schematic, draw a sketch, put all the information on it. List all of your assumptions, idealizations, and then solve the problem. So you see, it's a very formal structure. It probably is good to follow, but if you had to do that 15 times this week on those little problems, you'd probably get pretty tired of it, you know, so. Okay, um, I think that's it for this time. We've got just a couple minutes left. Um, we will launch into uh, chapter two on Thursday. I will be emailing you a link. This will be, I post these on YouTube. I have my own YouTube channel. I've had it for about two years. I have two likes. I think one of them was mine, but anyway, whatever. Um, but I will put it, and then I will email out a link to the lecture. So you can watch, if you can't sleep at night, there you go. Put this thing on there and you'll be out, you'll be out quick and I'll send you the solutions to the problems this week on that same email. So you guys have a great rest of the day, and I'll see you, I guess, a week from today. <laughs>